Section 13 of The Scrapbook, Volume 1, Sampler by Various, edited by Frank A. Muncy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bologna Times. Patrick Henry's Call to Arms, Section 13. The famous speech, which, delivered by the American Hampton in the Virginia Convention, kindled the fire of revolution in the thirteen colonies of 1775. In the thick of national crises, the ability to persuade others is the strongest power an individual can wield. Such a power was Patrick Henry's. From the earlier disagreements with the mother country, his influence was all for the assertion of colonial liberties. He was born May 9, 1736. In 1765, a young man not yet thirty, he became a member of the Virginia House of Burgesses. The Stamp Act had excited the people. Young Henry, with a presumption which angered many of his maturer colleagues, offered resolutions setting forth the rights of the colony. In the debate, he suddenly uttered the words, Caesar had his Brutus, Charles I his Cromwell, and George the Third. A clamor arose, and cries of treason, treason! With perfect coolness, the order continued, May profit by their example. Then, firmly, If this be treason, make the most of it. Thus began the public life of a man whose youth had been most unpromising in its slovenliness and laziness, who had failed at farming and at business, and who had succeeded at law only after a dubious beginning which was turned into triumph by a quite unlooked-for burst of eloquence. His services to his country continued until his voluntary retirement from public life in 1791, at the age of fifty-five. Subsequently, Washington and Adams offered him high offices, but Henry declined successively to be United States Senator, Secretary of State, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, or Minister to France. In 1799, urged by Washington, he consented to be elected to the Virginia Legislature, but died June 6, before taking his seat. We here print his great speech in the Virginia Convention, 1775, as recorded by his first biographer. Mr. President, it is natural for men to indulge in the illusions of hope. We are apt to shut our eyes against a painful truth, and listen to the song of that siren till she transforms us into beasts. Is this the part of wise men, engaged in a great and arduous struggle for liberty? Are we disposed to be of the number of those who, having eyes, see not, and having ears, hear not, the things which so nearly concern their temporal salvation? For my part, whatever anguish of spirit it may cost, I am willing to know the worst, and to provide for it. I have but one lamp by which my feet are guided, and that is the lamp of experience. I know of no way of judging of the future but by the past, and judging by the past, I wish to know what there has been in the conduct of the British ministry for the last ten years to justify those hopes with which gentlemen have been pleased to solace themselves and the house? Is it that insidious smile with which our petition has been lately received? Trust it not, sir. It will prove a snare to your feet. Suffer not yourselves to be betrayed with a kiss. Ask yourselves, how this gracious reception of our petition comports with those warlike preparations which cover our waters and darken our land. Are fleets and armies necessary to a work of love and reconciliation? Have we shown ourselves so unwilling to be reconciled that force must be called in to win back our love? Let us not deceive ourselves, sir. These are the implements of war and subjugation, the last arguments to which kings resort. I ask, gentlemen, sir, what means this martial array, if its purpose be not to force us to submission? Can gentlemen assign any other possible motive for it? Has Great Britain any enemy in this quarter of the world to call for all this accumulation of navies and armies? No, sir, she has none. They are meant for us they can be meant 
for no other they are sent over to bind and rivet upon us those chains which the british ministry have been so long forging and what have we to oppose to them shall we try argument sir we have been trying that for the last ten years have we anything new to offer upon the subject nothing we have held the subject up in every light of which it is capable but it has been all in vain shall we resort to entreaty and humble supplication what terms shall we find which have not been already exhausted let us not i beseech you sir deceive ourselves longer sir we have done everything that could be done to avert the storm which is now coming on we have petitioned we have remonstrated we have supplicated we have prostrated ourselves before the throne and have implored its interposition to arrest the tyrannical hands of the ministry and parliament our petitions have been slighted our remonstrances have produced additional violence and insult our supplications have been disregarded and we have been spurned with contempt from the foot of the throne in vain after these things may we indulge the fond hope of peace and reconciliation there is no longer any room for hope if we wish to be free if we mean to preserve inviolate those inestimable privileges for which we have been so long contending if we mean not basely to abandon the noble struggle in which we have been so long engaged and which we have pledged ourselves never to abandon until the glorious object of our contest shall be obtained we must fight i repeat it sir we must fight an appeal to arms and to the god of hosts is all that is left us they tell us sir that we are weak unable to cope with so formidable an adversary but when shall we be stronger will it be the next week or the next year will it be when we are totally disarmed and when a british guard shall be stationed in every house shall we gather strength by irresolution and inaction shall we acquire the means of effectual resistance by lying supinely on our backs and hugging the delusive phantom of hope until our enemies shall have bound us hand and foot sir we are not weak if we make a proper use of those means which the god of nature hath placed in our power three millions of people armed in the holy cause of liberty and in such a country as that which we possess are invincible by any force which our enemy can send against us besides sir we shall not fight our battles alone there is a just god who presides over the destinies of nations and who will raise up friends to fight our battles for us the battle sir is not to the strong alone it is to the vigilant the active the brave besides sir we have no election if we were base enough to desire it it is now too late to retire from the contest there is no retreat but in submission and slavery our chains are forged their clanking may be heard on the plains of boston the war is inevitable and let it come i repeat sir let it come it is vain sir to extenuate the matter gentlemen may cry peace peace but there is no peace the war has actually begun the next gale that sweeps from the north will bring to our ears the clash of resounding arms our brethren are already in the field why stand we here idle what is it that the gentlemen wish what would they have is life so dear or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery forbid it almighty god i know not what course others may take but as for me give me liberty or give me death End of section thirteen